Welcome back. It's been a great IoT day so far. It's our panel number three, uh, this time around IoT standards and protocols. And we have four speakers today. Uh, we have uh, Dominic, we have uh, Matthias, Tim and Adam. Uh, they're going to talk about protocols like MQTT, Co-op, how uh, one should uh, use, uh, why one should use uh, one or the other. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to great talks. Uh, so it's going to be 15 minutes each presentation. And at the end, uh, just like earlier, we will have uh, a Q&A session. Feel free to use the Q&A uh, section on the right-hand side of the video to, to, um, to let, uh, let us know and let me know that uh, you have a question. And we will try to make sure to answer the question at the end. So with this, I will uh, let Dominic uh, talk to us about MQTT. OK, thanks, Benjamin. So welcome to my talk about um, MQTT for the Internet of Things. Let me start with myself. I'm Dominic Ohlmeyer. I'm CTO at a Germany-based uh, company called DC Square. We are delivering software solutions for uh, cloud providers and for um, yeah, M2M solution providers. And yeah, I'm the uh, architect of uh, MQT broker called HiveMQ. Um, I help standardizing MQT at the OS Technical Committee. And yeah, I'm a speaker and an author about MQT, M2M, IoT, and so on. If you're interested in this stuff, you can follow me at Twitter. My Twitter ID is at the Obermeier. So yeah, let me start with the question, what is MQTT? Today we had a few great talks about MQTT or, or talks who mentioned MQTT, um, but now let's talk about what, what is MQTT actually. Um, at the simplest, um, MQTT is a messaging protocol. So um, it's uh, sometimes called the messaging protocol for the Internet of Things. Um, yeah, it's very, very simple, uh, very efficient. It sits on top of TCP, so if you want to use MQTT in your application, you have to make sure that you have at least a TCP stack available. Um, MQTT uh, is based on a publish-subscribe architecture, like many messaging systems. Uh, this ensures that it's uh, scalable, and also this makes it, um, yeah, it, you, you, can, you can scale it elastically with that approach, and also you can decouple your system with this architecture. MQTT is a binary protocol. That means, um, yeah, unlike HTTP, which is a text-based protocol, um, MQTT is completely binary, which is great because machines do binary, machines speak binary. And yeah, for humans, binary is not that optimal, but for machines, it's just great. Uh, it has a very minimal overhead. Um, so if you're choosing the, the smallest MQTT package, which is a, a ping, um, it just adds two bytes of overhead to your TCP package. Yeah, and MQT is designed for unreliable networks. Um, that means unreliable networks are essentially everything which has in the wire. <laughs> so if you have a mobile device, if you have a mobile network, um, it's probably unreliable. And last but not least, MQT is data agnostic, so it doesn't matter if you're sending pictures, text messages, or any other stuff via MQTT, it just doesn't matter. So um, what are great use cases for MQTT? I think MQTT always shines when you need push instead of pull. When you're comparing with HTTP, HTTP always uh, uses uh, polling. That means you have a client, you have a server, and the client polls at the server, OK, is there something interesting new? Is there something interesting new? And so on. So you will have a lot of overhead because you sequentially ask the server if there, there is something interesting. So you pull the server. With MQTT, you get a real push. So the, the MQTT broker, which I will talk later about, pushes mes messages to you if something interesting happens. So MQTT is great if bandwidth is at a premium. So if bandwidth is expensive, um, MQTT is a very, very good fit. So you often have this scenario in, uh, when you have a mobile network because the carriers uh, usually aren't that, that cheap. Um, it's also great if you have enterprise applications and now you, you're, you're facing a situation where you have to, to talk with mobile applications. Um, it's also worth considering to use MQTT. Uh, MQTT really shines when you need a reliable delivery of messages over unreliable networks. So as I already said, uh, mobile networks, for instance. 
Um, MQLT is also a very good fit for constrained devices with uh, low memory, with not much CPU, and yeah, and when low la latency is important, MQDT is also a good fit. So let me talk about some of the cool features of MQDT, um, which you can use in your application, which you get for free when using MQDT. Well, we have topic wildcards. Um, as with many published subscriber architecture systems, you're, you're talking about topics. So um, we have a decoupled system where clients agree um, how they talk to each other, what are the topics. And with MQT, you have wildcards, so you can, you're very flexible when you, when you want to subscribe to only certain messages. Mm -hmm. And this works very well with the wildcards MQT provides. We have three quality of service levels. That means uh, the, cli the client can uh, specify uh, how important it is that the message actually arrives. So if you have an um, unreliable network, this is very important because you can say it doesn't matter if the message arrives or not. Or you can say, okay, this is a business critical message. It has to arrive, and it has to arrive exactly once. But more, more about this later. MQT has a concept of retained messages, uh, last will and testament. I will uh, show these two features uh, in a few minutes. Um, also, it supports persistent sessions, which is a great feature if you have clients, um, MQT clients, which are disconnecting very often because of an unreliable network. Uh, so um, the, the MQDT broker actually um, yeah, persists your session information. If you're coming back, you don't have to uh, send all the data again. And uh, it supports heartbeats. So uh, this is a very, very simple uh, scheme of how MQDT uh, works. Um, we have a central instance in MQDT broker. And we have, um, on the left, we have some publishers. On the right, we have some subscribers. The publishers um, yeah, are publishing data. And the MQT broker is responsible that all the subscribers which are interested in the messages sent um, yeah, are getting the messages. A very important aspect um, of yeah, IoT in general is security. For MQDT, we have three levels of security, which we should consider using or consider not using. So um, on the protocol level, MQT itself provides username and, and, and password. If you don't add any additional security, uh, an attacker could easily get your username and your password because he can sniff it on the wire, and so we get a problem. But the protocol itself supports this, but we have to make sure we are adding additional security. So for instance, um, we could think about uh, encrypt, encrypting our payload. This is very common, um, but yeah, and this also works, but uh, it's, it's not enough, I think. Then we have to consider using transport um, security. We can use TLS, so we get a secure channel, a secure communication, and we can also use uh, client certificate authentication if we want. Um, this gives additional security, and it's great if, if we yeah, it's in our hand. If the devices we deploy are in our hands, and if the cloud platform we are using is in our hands, then it's great to use client certificate authentication. Um, and on the broker itself, most or many message brokers support um, some kind of permission management um, or access control lists or, so or something. So it's uh, it's important that you restrict um, certain topics for publishing and subscribing. So not every client can send any message to anyone. This is very important. And it's also very important um, that um, yeah, you, you can integrate your MQTT solution, your MQTT broker, to existing systems. Um, most, most of the people already have uh, databases for their device list, their device management, or there are some other APIs we can call. And with that, we can gain um, more security, but with MQTT, it's important to know you have to do it yourself. So MQT, MQT itself isn't secure. Um, we have to, to consider using these three levels of security. OK, then let's, call, let's talk about quality of service levels. Um, with MQTT, we get three quality of service levels. So we can say, OK, I send a message with quality of service zero. That means, OK, when a message arrives, it's great. If it doesn't arrive, it doesn't matter. So it's delivered once or never. Uh, when we're 
when we want more reliability, we can use quality source one. So a message is delivered once or more than once. This adds an additional protocol overhead, but um, not that much. If you want to make sure each message arrives once and only once, you should consider using quality service too. It's more complex, it has additional protocol flow, but um, at the end, it makes sure that each message is only delivered exactly once. Another cool feature of MQTT is last will and testament. So what you can do with it when you, when you connect, when a client connects to MQT broker, it can say, hey, when I die, when I, when I disconnect ungrate, not gracefully, please uh, send a message on my behalf. So um, the MQT broker, if, if he recognizes that a, a client died, um, it sends messages to a certain topic, and our devices can react on that. Another great feature are retained messages. Um, retained messages um, yeah, are, are a concept, so you can, each, each message a client sends can be, can be stored on the MQT message broker um, on that topic, so if a client subscribes and yeah, there, there isn't any communication yet, uh, the client gets the, the last uh, good known value on this topic and he can, yeah, and the, the device can, can start um, working directly. Okay, let's talk about um, brokers and clients. So, as I said, we need at least one message broker in our communication. Um, the most popular, I think, is Mosquito. Mosquito is an open source uh, message broker. It's very, very good for constrained environments. It's written in C. It has a very, very low footprint. And, yeah, and it supports the MQT spec uh, for 100%. And also, it supports bridging, so you can bridge uh, different brokers together. This is a very, very great feature, so you can gain um, reliability and uh, scalability with that approach. Also, there is HiveMQ. This is the, the broker we, we are developing at DZ Square. It's a high-performance MQT broker. It has some, some cool features like native WebSocket support, so your web application can speak, can speak MQT natively. Um, it has a plugin system, supports clustering and bridging. So if, if you're using MQT in a mission critical application, this is a broker you, sh you, could, you could consider using. There are some other brokers and, and, and platforms which, um, which uh, can talk MQTT and which are MQT brokers. Um, the here's a link where you can see all brokers available. Um, these are pre pretty much. So for the MQT clients, there is, um, I would recommend, look at the uh, PAHO um, implementation. It's a reference implementation of MQT or a reference <laughs> implementation. Uh, it's open source. Um, it's very, very great. It has a high, very high quality. Um, and it's available in different languages. So it's available in Java and JavaScript, Lua, C, C++, Go, Python. And yeah, I think there are more implementations to come. The JavaScript library from Paho actually uses WebSockets, so um, you can use it if you want your, your web application to speak MQTT. There are many, many other uh, libraries available. Um, if you're interested in that, here is a link um, you can go to. Um, yeah, I think there are MQT libraries for any language you, you can imagine. Now, uh, let me finish with some real-world use cases of MQT. Where is MQT actually used? And let's start with uh, the, the poster boy, the MQT poster boy, Facebook Messenger. Facebook Messenger uses, um, uses MQTT for uh, delivering messages to more than 800, 850 million uh, users. And yeah, the, the use case here is a chat application. And the gain benefit are improved battery life and less bandwidth. Also, MQT is used frequently in smart home solutions. Um, most of the open source um, smart home solutions out there, including Eclipse Open Hub, um, have MQTT uh, adapters for speaking MQTT, and they are used very frequently. And last but not least, um, this is where MQTT origins from. Um, pipeline monitoring, uh, it's 
it's very a very good fit if you um, are using satellite links instead of mobile networks, for instance, and their bandwidth is really at, at premium. So I want to finish with this slide. Uh, this is uh, the Google Trends from yesterday. This is the search volume of MQTT. And as you see, MQTT is getting much, much traction. So um, if you didn't know about MQTT before, I think it's worth watching. It's worth watching where it's going, going for the next years or, or months. And yeah, I personally think um, IoT and MQTT are fit very, very good together. And yeah, you should monitor it. So thank you. Thanks, Dominique. Wow, that was a, a good intro to MQTT in 15 minutes. Good job. Um, so I guess we will have uh, some questions for you at the end. Uh, again, please uh, please use the Q&A if you have questions about MQTT. You may actually have more questions after uh, the other presentations because we're going to talk about some other protocols. Uh, and now it's going to be Matthias who develops a co-op library and is going to explain what co-op is about. So Matthias, yeah, we can see your screen. I guess you just need to unmute your audio and you're going to be on. Thank you very much, Ben. So my talk will be about co-op and the web of things. So um, I'm a researcher at ETH Zurich, and I'm also an active member in the co-working group at the ITF, who yeah, basically defines the standards for co-op. And yeah, recently, I also joined the Eclipse uh, yeah, project, um, where my California implementation is now available. So let's hop right in. What is co-op? So uh, co-op is a new web protocol that basically closes the gap between the web technology we know that helps to build these huge, amazing um, applications uh, we know, and to close this, um, this gap towards the IoT. So IoT devices, small constraint devices um, that, that don't really work with the full heavyweight web technology that, that we know. So um, the constraint application protocol is designed to, to work over the, the usual internet, so, so the IETF standards. So it work, uh, works over IP and so on. And it enables us to, to have uh, embedded web service, for instance, on really, really small and constrained devices. So why would we want to do this? So why, why the web technology? So, so the main point is to have usability and interoperability at, at the application layer. Uh, for the IoT. So usability is really important to, to have enough developers actually for the Internet of Things. And also it's, it's really complex. The whole thing is really complex. So it, it has to be usable so that um, developers can also develop really complex applications and, and don't miss important parts about security and so on. So we, we have all these great well-known patterns from, from web technology, how to implement applications, how to scale them, and so on. That's what we want to use for the IoT as well, using co-op. So for instance, you can use simple scripting, as you know it, web-like scripting for your home devices. So if you want to monitor your plants or um, have uh, yeah, the heating system, um, you can use JavaScript, for instance, and, and just do it like the AJAX you know from, from the web world. And the, the, the final goal is actually to, to have these web mashups with real physical objects so that you can. So, Matthias, we're having an issue with your slides. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, would you mind uh, sharing your screen again? So the point is to, to really have it usable, to, to use the well-known patterns from the web to develop your IoT applications. So let's, let's have a closer look at co-op, what it is. So it's a RESTful binary protocol that, that was actually designed from scratch in the ITF. So what we have, because it's a REST implementation, we have this transparent mapping to HTTP for, for the basic features. But there are also additional features um, that are specifically for IoT applications. So um, co-op, you, you can divide it into basically two sub-layers. So there's the the request response sublayer, which uh, handles the, the RESTful interactions. So you have the, the well-known methods like um, get, post, put, and delete. You can use your eyes to, to address um, yeah, the resources, for instance, on your devices. And to, to exchange data, you use the internet media types that are already there. So you can use JSON or um, something more compact. 
and um, yeah, that that brings you into the web world. Below that, we we have a a, a small message sublayer that that handles reliability basically. Um, that's because Coop runs over UDP instead of TCP, um, because there there were many issues over lossy networks. So if you have this low power wireless communication, multiple hops, and so on, the performance of of uh, TCP isn't that well. And um, so for that reason, the co-op runs over UDP. It also gives um, advantages if you have low latency requirements and so on. So there is this message sublayer which uh, provides the deduplication, for instance, so you don't receive requests twice. And there are also the retransmissions, so you can add this reliability you know from TCP back so that, that you can make sure your, your message will arrive and um, yes, yeah, so usually you, uh, the basic would be you run it over UDP, but um, there's also DTLS, which is the datagram version of TLS. So you have all the security measurements you, you know from HTTP, basically you can also use for co-op. So let's look at the, the additional features that are interesting for us, for, for the IoT people. So, so the, the central one I would say is observing resources. So um, it's, it's a bit like what we saw for MQTT. So we want to push um, data to, towards the client if something changes. And in, in co-op, you, you do a get request, but you have this additional observe option. And what you receive back is, is a response, also with an observe option called the notification then. And then basically you transfer the state from the origin server to your client. And then whenever the state changes at the origin server, you receive new notifications and then also have a copy of the state of the original resource locally at lo your client. So what could happen is that the notification gets lost, for instance. So um, underneath all this, so it's still REST, so you have caching, you, you have these cache control issues, so you uh, uh, thing, uh, features, you locally have a cache, for instance, and uh, representation will be valid until it expires, so the max age is, is expired. And usually in, in IoT applications, you will have a new state change and get a new notification and carry on again. If it's really important, so you need every state change, you can also send these notifications, of course, in this reliable way with uh, confirmable messages. And yeah, then you, you have uh, similar push uh, features as you have, for instance, in MQTT. The other cool thing about co-op is that you can have group communication. So it's, it's based on UDP also because you can have IP multicast. So you, you have, um, for instance, all your lights on in a, different, uh, a specific room or whole floor. You, you can um, yeah, send, send a request to all of them at once using a multicast address. So um, it's interesting if you want to monitor multiple things or, or control them and, and have a good, uh, yeah, good manageability of, of the whole application. So this RESTful group communication is, is a really interesting new feature we get with Co-op. And a re really interesting thing in the Internet of Things where we have really many different devices is that you can have alternative transports. So the default, as I said, is, is UDP and running over IP and so on. But um, actually, you would be, we are working on, on bindings for, for different transports like SMS or the USSD. You might know if you punch in these, these codes uh, shown here in the, with the gray background. Um, in, in your mobile, and then you can send messages also over these transports, but you keep the interoperability because you can still use your eyes in, in your applications to address a specific resource, and um, then the configuration of your system will figure out how to, to get this SMS, for instance, to the container of bananas that is somewhere on the ocean currently, and once it, it um, has a connection again, it, it will receive that SMS, and then it can respond. And it can also then, for instance, start up a new IP connection, which was powered down to save energy, but open this and then send a response there. And finally, which, which is also very important if, if you have um, yeah, Internet of Things or M2M applications, is a discovery mechanism. So in co-op, there's a built-in dis uh, resource discovery mechanism built on web linking. So um, that's an RFC that's out there for, for quite some time already. And it was extended to the core link format. So what that provides are these attributes you, you can see in, uh, yeah, over the green background. So you can uh, define some resource types to, to make quick lookups. So, so REST says typed resources are bad. 
the, the thing is here, this is kind of uh, annotation so that we can have out-of-band information like a sitemap, what resources are there and what can they provide so you don't have to, to spider the, the whole uh, server but can, can quickly find the resources you need. You can also annotate what, what uh, content type they, they have. So here it's an integer, so this is to, to uh, facilitate uh, small and constraint devices so they don't have this string parsing and so on. And yeah, you, you can easily explore what, what is provided. So this also works over group communication. So you can have an IP multicast discovery to, let's say, to all co-op nodes in this subnet. And then you see um, what you have. Or you can look, are there thermometers, for instance, send a request. And then you get back those resources who provide, um, for instance, temperature in degrees Celsius. The other way around would be that you use uh, resource directories. So when a device boots up, it registers with this resource directory, and then you can do offline lookups, basically, which also allows devices to sleep, for instance, for a long time. But um, you know they are there because they registered with this resource directory. So um, to finish my, my talk, I want to show you some cool projects that you could use to, to play with co-op a bit and yeah, build your own applications. So the first thing is, is the Californium co-op framework in Java that is now, yeah, in the process moving to, to the Eclipse Foundation. So it's an open source uh, Java implementation. It was kind of the ITF running code to, to yeah, design and, and develop co-op. Um, yeah, as I said, it's now an Eclipse project and it implements the proposed standard. So you have the additional features as well as uh, observing resources, blockwise transfers, and there's also DTLS 1.2 support so to have security. Other interesting things, uh, another of my projects, for instance, is the Copper Browser. So this is a plugin for Firefox uh, that allows you to use the web browser to debug and test your applications as you're used to if you are a web developer and do RESTful applications and develop them. You often use your web browser to check it out. And now you can do the same thing with, with Co-op. And of course, you, you can um, yeah, play with small devices if you have them. So one is the, the Erbium REST engine for the Contiki operating system. There's also a co-op implementation for TinyOS. And yeah, I put in some other links to, to other small implementations of co-op. Um, yeah, that might be interesting to you if you want to build small Internet of Things applications. And that's actually it. Excellent. Thanks, Matthias. Um, so next is going to be Tim. Uh, actually, we had some questions on the, on the Q&A uh, uh, section already. People wondering um, when they should use MQTT, when they should use Co-op. Both are very popular protocol. And hopefully, Tim has some answers for us. Uh, so Tim, if you would like to just unmute your audio, start sharing your screen. Hello. Uh, thank you, Ben. All right, so uh, my talk is about uh, MQTT. I said MQTT uh, versus co-app. Um, it's not really so much a, a fight here as I'm trying to depict, but I'm trying, trying to bring out some of the differences between the, pro uh, the protocols, the architectures behind them. And uh, uh, you can actually do a lot of things. Um, and and so, to some extent, you can uh, use only MQTT and still do some, some things that are only available to restful, restful architectures. Uh, and, and vice versa as well. So um, first of all, just on the, on the title slide here, uh, there's uh, the first major difference is that CoAP doesn't, uh, doesn't have a logo. And that's, that's because it's, uh, it's a pretty new protocol. Um, I have the ITF spec pulled up right now. And it's, um, the, the release date on it is June uh, 28th, uh, 2013. So that's a pretty recent spec um, versus MQTT has been around for 10, 15 years, so it's, uh, it's pretty well rooted, um, pretty well established. Uh, so that's, that's probably the first major difference. Um, so this isn't a particularly informative slide. Uh, it's already been covered pretty well. Um, so CoAP is kind of modeled after a REST architecture. And the important thing with REST architecture is it's, uh, it's about uh, resources. Uh, so clients are trying to modify or change or delete or just read and get a resource. Um, and so, uh, go, go ahead to the next slide. Uh, so you, you typically use, uh, you know, there's the, the four uh, verbs that are used with MQT, oh, with uh, co-app. So the get, post, put, delete. Um, but with resources, resources are scalar values, meaning that it's just one single value. It's not a list of values. It's not a set of values. 
Uh, I mean, you can you can kind of make that out of a JSON uh, data format or XML, but those are those are kind of tacked on to the protocol itself. Um, so all the the, the natural uh, protocol um, features are are, are uh, labeling resources kind of a scalar value, and so the last known value is what's important. So when I do a GET request to a certain resource, I'm getting the last known value of that. So that that's that, that does become important um, later on. So Benjamin, can you hit the next slide? So contrast that with uh, pub sub architecture, uh, which is kind of made to uh, decouple uh, the consumption from production of messages, which is really nice feature sometimes. If you have a sensor that's a really low uh, um, constraint, a constrained environment, um, might have spotty network connectivity, might have uh, maybe spotty power uh, requirements and might not might go offline unexpectedly frequently um, you want publishers to be able to just simply publish and not care about if the subscriber is consuming messages correctly uh, so that's a really handy aspect to PubSub to MQTT um, also as opposed to uh, rest based protocols where there's a the history of uh, the, the values of a resource is it so I like to kind of refer to it as like an events. Uh, um, PubSub kind of pr provides a, an event stream, so it's a sensor. As you read a uh, sensor value, you get a, uh, you get one value, and you read it again, you get another value. And each of these values kind of have this time component attached because there's an ordering of when the values were uh, read. Um, so this can become useful if, say, you uh, want to do some predictive analytics, and say you have a temperature sensor that uh, currently is reading 22 degrees Celsius and you want to know what the next reading is going to be. If you're only looking at that 22 degrees Celsius, it's hard to predict anything other than 22 degrees Celsius. But if you have a history of, uh, of values, say it, it has been recently reading um, 16 degrees, and then it was 18 degrees, then it was 20 degrees, and now it's 22 degrees, there's it's Pretty easy to make a guess that the next reading is going to be 24 degrees. So if you if you do need those historical values, you need to do if you need to do uh, predictive analytics or big data analytics, uh, PubSub is usually uh, the better uh, architecture that you want to shoot after. Um, so as far as publish subscribe, um, you can actually implement uh, PubSub on CoApp. There's a, what's called an observe option that you can set. So you make a you make a GET request and set the observe flag. And what that means is that when the, the, the server responds with uh, the current value of the resource, and then every time that resource changes, uh, it sends an, an additional uh, response. With, uh, so th this is kind of a way to implement PubSub, because there's no polling involved. Um, and so it's pretty convenient like that. You can also implement REST on MQTT also. Uh, this is uh, basically used by... Um, so, so with, with REST, you have a client and you have a server. And so in this case, the REST client is going to be uh, the, a publisher. So it's going to publish to a request topic, and subscriber subscribes to, and then it's also going to uh, subscribe to a, a response topic. And the server um, is not actually the broker. The server is actually a subscriber. Uh, so it's kind of a peer to the client. Uh, so this is kind of an example of how someone might implement uh, REST over MQTT. So you have a request topic. Uh, the first thing to note here is uh, these topics start with a dollar sign. And in uh, the latest MQTT spec, that uh, has been standardized to mean that um, messages sent on these topics uh, won't uh, be captured by the, the pound uh, subscription, the Firehose subscription. So that's kind of a convenient feature of MQTT. But so anyways. Um, there's a few uh, important pieces of information that need to be sent. Uh, first of all, the client ID and also the request ID. In this particular request topic, um, I'm not sending the request ID inside the topic. Uh, it's probably sent inside the body. It has to be sent. It could be sent inside the topic. But both the request ID and the client ID can be sent either in the topic or um, the body. Uh, as far as the domain and the app uh, IDs, or um, pieces of information. Uh, those are purely used for uh, namespacing. And uh, that's that's actually an interesting aspect. So since you have a, 
a single broker, you could have several um, quote servers attached to this broker, and you have to specify which server you're trying to make a request to. Uh, so you need to include some namespace information, uh, like domain and application, uh, to make sure it's routed to that the correct place. And so one of the, the problems with uh, this approach comes out immediately is that um, uh, two, two servers could potentially listen to the same topic and both res re uh, return responses to the same client request uh, because of this namespacing issue. Um, and it, even worse, I mean, what if those two responses were completely different? Uh, so you could run into some serious problems with this. So uh, just to kind of summarize, REST on MQTT, unfortunately, is not really simple. There's a lot of corner cases that aren't figured out. And it also requires a lot of additional uh, protocol um, on top of MQTT that's, that hasn't been standardized at all. Uh, as, as far as I know, no one's wrote, written more than uh, some blog posts about it, maybe just mentioned the idea of standardizing some sort of uh, formal spec for um, doing REST on MQTT. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of corner cases, like responses aren't guaranteed to arrive. Uh, there, there's ways to figure out if the, the request failed, but it's not standardized at all. Um, so there's not much interoperability, there's not much composability or extensibility. And the, the last bullet point is just, I, uh, I don't particularly like including a lot of mutable state in um, applications, especially server applications, and this requires a lot of mutable state. I feel like that leads to, uh, towards a lot of errors. Thank you for listening. Um, but that's kind of in my speech. Uh, you can feel free to uh, ask some questions uh, later on when you have a chance. I, I was on mute. Uh, thanks, Tim. It was uh, was great. Thanks, uh, and sorry for the um, for the trouble with uh, the screen sharing. It would have been bad to miss all these slides, right? With uh, <laughs> the bears and the cats and stuff. Uh, yeah, it was really great. I'm sure we will have discussions ab about uh, rest um, uh, rest parading for for MQTT at the end. Uh, uh, we've had some questions on the on the Q and A about uh, best practices for MQTT namespacing and stuff. So. Uh, uh, keep the questions coming, and um, next speaker is going to be Adam. Uh, looks like we can see your screen. Uh, sounds good. So, uh, if I'm correct, you're going to talk about uh, other protocols for IoT, more on the wireless uh, domain. Yes. Um, so welcome first. And Thank you. Uh, Thanks for having me. Sure. Um, so a little bit about myself, I'm uh, the founder of a brand called ConnectSense. Uh, our company, Grid Connect, has been in the embedded networking space uh, for the last 20 years. Uh, last November, we founded and launched ConnectSense, which is our line of wireless sensors for monitoring the home and office. Uh, and a little bit different than the others, we're going to talk a little bit more about hardware and communication standards. This is a little graphic kind of outlining some of the communication standards available today. Uh, as you can see, there's a wide variety of them and um, just a ton of mess. So somebody that's looking to create a, an IoT device um, has a lot of decisions to make on, on what they're going to do, how they're going to communicate, and things like that. Um, so the question here is, uh, can all these wireless technologies really live in harmony? Uh, as we're all looking to move the market forward, um, achieve things like the smart home and all of the, you know, kind of pie in the sky goals that we have for IoT, uh, is all of this differentiation in wireless communication really holding us back from, from mass adoption? So kind of the questions I'd like you to keep in mind as we talk further is, should we all standardize on, on one wireless communication technology? And can we? Uh, is it even possible? So primarily, I'm going to talk about the four main ones that are used um, specifically in, in smart home uh, and I think in general across the, across the industry right now. And those are Zigbee, Z-Wave. Uh, Bluetooth, uh, primarily talking about BLE and Wi-Fi. 
So first going to talk a little bit about Zigbee. Its physical range is around 10 to 20 meters, uh, and it's widely known for its mesh capabilities. It's small and it has it's pretty low power, and it's controlled primarily by the Zigbee Alliance. So some of the things that are really advantages of Zigbee is its low power and advanced sleep capabilities. And due to the uh, channel it operates in, it has high signal penetration ability, so the ability to go through walls. Uh, this is also because it's it uses 900 megahertz frequencies, so it's not a very crowded communication channel. It's very robust for you know getting through walls and things like that. Uh, one of the other advantages of Zigbee is that the chips are manufactured by multiple silicon vendors. So this include Texas Instruments, Atmel, Silicon Labs, Freescale, and some others. Um, so as we'll see in some of the other standards, um, they're more tightly controlled. So this, having so many vendors there, there's a lot more chance for competition, uh, drive the price down, things like that. You're not stuck with one vendor to do that. Uh, it also is a self-healing network. So part of part of that mesh architecture is the fact that if you lose one one node, um, you're not going to lose your whole network. Uh, it's able to self-heal and reroute communication um, based on based on that node dropping. And it also allows for a large number of nodes. So in practical applications, this is, number is around 500, but theoretically they talk as high as 65,000 theoretical nodes. Some of the cons and, and things that uh, that people don't like about Zigbee are the uh, the low data rates, so it can only do about 250 kilobits per second max. Uh, there's also some interoperability issues, so uh, a Zigbee device from one manufacturer may or may not work with another, so that's something I've read a little bit about. Uh, and then also a gateway is generally required for internet access, so that adds some extra hardware to the mix and things you have to take into account, usually some extra cost. Um, there's also some licensing involved uh, where you either have to be an alliance member or, um, or do something to get approved through the alliance. Also there's some antenna requirements um, that can call for a little bit larger antenna, so uh, will cause products to be a little bit larger as well. Some of the examples where it's being used today, uh, Philips Hue, um, Nest actually uses it as a secondary communication method. Uh, here in the US, Comcast and Xfinity uses it using an eye control system, and it's also used by Crestron. Um, next one we're going to talk a little bit about is Z-Wave. Uh, Z-Wave is controlled by the Z-Wave Alliance. It is a physical range around 300 meters, and like Zigbee, it's also a mesh network. It, however, only has a limit of 232 nodes. Some of the things that people like about it, um, the low power and single signal penetration, as well as the self-healing, these are all ways that it's very similar to Zigbee. But it's also been touted as being a very simple protocol that's easy to understand and design. And, and like Zigbee, it's also in the 900 megahertz spectrum, so it's not as crowded of a channel. Um, some of the some of the cons and, and weaknesses that I read about the signal, it has only one single silicon manufacturer, which is Sigma Design. So they basically control the market of Z-Wave chips, and therefore, you know, it's not as competitive of a market. Licensing, you have to go through them. So it's a little bit more controlled, closed standard. Like uh, Zigbee, it also has a gateway required, and there's some discovery and pairing um, things that are required. And then also the limited number of nodes. Obviously, 232 nodes um, seems like a lot right now, um, but as we continue to add more and more IoT devices, people may find that that limit is uh, creating some issues. Um, some people that use it, in the market today, it's used by Smart Things, uh, Quickset, which is a lock manufacturer, and a product called Mikasa Verde. Next, we're going to talk about a little bit about Bluetooth, um, particularly Bluetooth 4.0, uh, which is known as Bluetooth Low Energy, or also branded as Bluetooth Smart. Uh, it typically has a range around 10 meters and a speed of around 1 megabit per second. 
And a lot of people talk to this about um, specifically around iBeacon technology. Um, iBeacon is actually Apple's proprietary name for um, using Bluetooth 4.0, but it's usually often used in um, location and presence contexts. Um, some of the things people like about Bluetooth, it's high install base, uh, creates very easy connectivity with mobile devices. And then they're working on adding some more mesh-like capabilities in Bluetooth 4.1, so then it'll have more of that same mesh network that people like about um, Z-Wave and Zigbee. It has a relatively simple connection and pairing process. This is something that got even simpler in, in Bluetooth 4.0. And then they also added the low power requirements. Um, some of the things that, some of the disadvantages, um, the Bluetooth 4.0 requires much newer hardware and is not as backwards compatible, and it also operates in the busy 2.4 uh, spectrum. Where it's being used right now, um, primarily in smart devices and wearables, so things like the Nike Plus, um, smart watches, Google Glass, uh, and things along those lines. And uh, lastly, I wanted to talk about Wi-Fi. Um, Wi-Fi, the most common of these protocols used uh, for wireless communication, um, likely something that all of you have in your home and workplace. So that's one of the, the largest advantages to Wi-Fi. It has the largest install base of any wireless communication, and it's something that most people are, are relatively familiar with. It has a lot of high data rates, um, which are obviously dependent on which version of Wi-Fi you use and a very simple connection process that most people are are very familiar with. Most of the cons and uh, disadvantages that people talk about a lot is the power requirements. Um, it's known as a very power heavy protocol and uh, the cost of components as well. Um, and then the busy 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. Uh, especially when you start to talk about the number of IoT devices that will be you know, adding in the future, um, that spectrum, which is already busy, uh, is going to continue to get busier. Um, some examples of where it's being used in the market today, uh, devices like the Nest thermostat and their smoke detectors, Belk and Wemo, uh, Y-Things, Electric Imp, which is used in a number of devices, and then our, uh, our ConnectSense platform also uses Wi-Fi. So I also wanted to touch a little bit on um, why we chose to use Wi-Fi for our particular product. Um, you know, we really looked at the market and the available technologies, and we wanted something that was very accessible to the wider market, uh, especially because we wanted to touch on consumers. Um, so we sort of started from the weaknesses of Wi-Fi and worked on ways that we could get past those, those problem areas, um, specifically around powers. So how we went about doing that was uh, intelligently sleeping and waking the wireless uh, when we're using battery power. Um, so by using a secondary power uh, processor in low power mode, we can operate on batteries for a very long time and only wake that radio on a vent or using a heartbeat, things like that. Um, so that allows us to have a lot more flexibility and counter some of those weaknesses that are typically seen with um, with Wi-Fi. So in summary, um, none of these technologies are really perfect. Um, they each have their own strengths and weaknesses and applications where they're going to shine. Um, in the end, the technology and the, the wireless communication really needs to just get out of the way of, uh, of the use case and be as seamless as possible to the end consumer. And whatever technology can do this the best, um, I think ultimately will win out. So um, also, you know, I think we all need to work together um, to move IoT forward. We need to be cognizant of all these things and, and make it as simple as possible and just kind of continue this con conversation, much like we're having today, um, to, you know, standardize and see where we can all work together um, to ensure the success and the wider market adoption of IoT. So please follow us uh, on Twitter at, at ConnectSense, and uh, we'd love to continue the conversation with you.
Thanks, Adam. Uh, maybe I will start with a, uh, a very quick, obvious question. On top of Wi-Fi, do you use protocols like CoAP and MQTT? Adam, you're on mute. Uh, well, that that question was directed at me. Uh, yeah, I, I was just, uh, yeah, uh, sorry if that wasn't clear. I just wanted to know if uh, in ConnectSense uh, on top of Wi-Fi you use protocols like MQTT or CoAP? Um, we're not using either of those today. We're just using our own REST API um, for communication with our cloud. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've had... Um, uh, a few questions on the uh, on the on the Q and A. Uh, many questions around co-op and MQTT, obviously. Um, so maybe what we could start with is a, a question around. Well, of course, there is the obvious question: when when is it best to use co-op and MQTT? Um, and maybe we will use uh, to answer that question. I guess that will be directed to our three first uh, panelists. Um, why would I do REST on MQTT? What are the use cases that you guys see for that or that you actually have implemented? So Dominic, Matthias, Tim, what do you guys think when one should do REST on MQTT? Um, I can take that. This is Tim. Um, hmm. So uh, one particular case is if you want to, uh, let's see, like push out a, a software update. Um, uh, so MQTT is great for telemetry data when you're just reading sensors and pushing, just pushing data out. Uh, there's a lot of other use cases. Uh, most of the web runs on um, REST, and so there's, there's a lot of people out there who know how to use REST. Um, I, it's kind of a not a great answer, but there's there's a lot to it, um, and there's a lot of use cases uh, out there. Dominic or Matthias, do you have anything to add on regarding REST on MQTT? Not directly. Um, I, I personally think um, MQTT is great for for, pu for pushing out data, but um, if if you need a REST architecture, I personally am in favor of CoAP or HTTP. So I, I think these uh, protocols MQTT and CoAP or and or HTTP uh, work great together. And yeah. I, I personally aren't a fan of, of uh, the, the REST approach for MQTT. Mm -hmm. and, and another question that we have, and I think this is uh, kind of related. Um, yeah, we've talked about, I mean, when Tim uh, uh, explained how to do REST on top of MQTT, there are obviously some best practices around the around MQTT, how one should structure the topics that do the namespacing and, and stuff. So we have a question from uh, from Thomas uh, asking if there are any resources providing patterns or best practices for designing, implementing MQTT-based solutions, uh, or are there any good samples uh, we should look at in terms of, yeah, again, topics, namespacing, uh, payload formatting, Thoughts on that? I can speak on that. Um, uh, there, as far as I know, there's not a whole lot of resources uh, that are available on, on the internet. There's there's several um, like blogs and stuff, but it's pretty disparate, spread out. Um, I've just kind of on the side. I am uh, co-authoring a book uh, called Mastering the Internet of Things. We'll, we'll cover a lot of these patterns. Um, that's going to be out in like June, so it's not even not even available right now. So I apologize for that. But um, as far as free resources, uh, actually, I would recommend going to uh, there's a GitHub page. Um, I tweeted a link to it a while ago um, that has a whole bunch of uh, like rich information about MQT and how people are using it. Uh, it's not real complete, but it has a lot of really good starting places. So. I'd, um, Maybe if I can dig out the link, I'll probably paste it into this forum here. Yeah, that would be great. Dominic, did you have anything to add on uh, yeah, best practice? Um, how, how do you guys do with your customers? And yeah, there, there are some, some patterns um, when it comes to the topic structure. Um, what we found is, which works very, very well, is uh, using the, the client ID in the topic names. Um, so when designing MQT topics, you it feels a bit like REST. 
sometimes, um, because it is also a hierarchic um, yet yeah, topic, and yeah, when when using the client ID uh, in in the yeah in the topic, uh, it works very great to to speak to uh, yeah to to address um, specific devices and and to subscribe to specific devices. Um, it's very when using MQT. It's very, very, very important to make sure you completely understand what you're doing with your topic structure, because uh, if you're doing it wrong, it can be a problem. But I don't know if there there are any um, resources or, or papers on that how to how to do it. Um, we have for best practices, but I believe there there was an EclipseCon talk about about that. But yeah, uh, but this is a field where. Yeah, there is definitely room for for some more blog posts or so, something like that. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, one one question I had, um, uh, Matthias, during your talk, you mentioned uh, co-op over SMS. I I wonder um, how mature the technology is, and if you guys see more and more um, usage of. MQTT, or maybe, yeah, maybe uh, Dominic, you will have a few words about MQTT uh, SCN. Do you guys see uh, these um, these protocols being used over something else than IP? Like, yeah, SMS is definitely a good example. Yes, so um, this is a specific example that actually comes from a research project uh, the guys in Bremen have. So um, there it started with these containers uh, with bananas, actually, that are shipped over the sea. And the thing is, um, you cannot maintain the IP connection from a um, GPIS module or whatever for, for a long time because it, it really costs a lot of energy. And uh, SMS comes in handy because it's delay tolerant. The, the infrastructure stores the messages for you. And uh, receiving an SMS is really um, energy efficient. So that's why it's um, currently really interested. So there are several drafts in the working group that tackle this, this problem. Um, so Markus Becker is actually one one of the people who is working on that, and uh, Timo from Nokia is also um, looking into these alternative transports. So to to make it um, yeah transparent, um, what transport you are actually using. So you have this URI that defines your resource, and then you can reach it uh, whatever transport is specified within this this URI. So um, it's it's not mature at all. So it's a completely new idea that we saw because of the requirements. But um, yeah, the ITF is definitely working on it. And, and Dominic, do you have, uh, or, or Tim actually, uh, uh, can you maybe quickly tell us about uh, MQTTS and what it does for uh, for allowing transport over uh, uh, other yeah kind of transport layers? Um, sure. Uh, this is Tim again. Um, so MQTTS and it's, uh, provides just a really super light layer of uh, maps very directly to MQTT. However, the network packets are actually quite a bit different. Um, but it's, so as if MQTT wasn't light enough, MQTT SN for sensor networks um, is actually much, much lighter than stock MQTT. And it's kind of made for those uh, very lossy networks like Zigbee and uh, power line communication and um, those noisy, noisy networks. Uh, so that's, uh, not sure if that answers the question. But no, that definitely helps. Um, um, a question for uh, for Adam: um, is, is it part of uh, your decision to 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 finally use Wi-Fi that uh, so many of the technologies you mentioned are governed and controlled by some alliances that are not always very open in their yeah governance model? Right. In my finding, uh, it seemed like Z-Wave was actually the most closed of all those due to um, the supply, how the supply is handled and things like that. Um, both them and Z-Wave, I believe, or, and Zigbee require a pl alliance uh, membership in order to um, get an approved device that will be interoperable with others. Um, so those seem to be a lot more closed, um, whereas Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, uh, you, they have their own alliances, but not uh, not the same kind of requirements to get devices using those protocols. Okay, okay. And so I guess even, uh, yeah, Bluetooth, even with the arrival of Bluetooth Low Energy in uh, 
um, in more and more smartphones, it's still kind of a closed technology then? Um, it is, but I don't. it doesn't have the same requirements. You don't have to join the Bluetooth SIG to put a product out there as far as I'm aware. Okay, okay. Um, well, one thing that maybe we, uh, it's a question maybe for all of you guys, um, in, in terms of security, um, do you think we are um, we are having the right uh, the right maturity and in, in MQTT in in, in co-op? Do we have the right uh, the right balance between uh, um, enough security and something that can fit into uh, into very tiny constrained devices? Any thoughts on on security in general? So maybe I can start for for co-ops. So. Um, the basics are there, so we, we have DTLS, which is out there, so it's a part of the whole transport layer security um, yeah, framework, so um, you can have certificates and so on. So it works if you want to bring out your application that is kind of closed. But what's still missing there is um, kind of the OAuth uh, for, for co-op or these constraint devices, so to, to really have something flexible. And that's a real challenge, so I mean, the, if it if you look closely, the TLS is kind of screwed up in the web as well. So a lot of certificates are always expired. You accept it anyway. So how should a small device decide on that? And um, that's something bigger that has to be solved. So the first step is actually how to, to yeah, handle better all these certificates and then how to get something lightweight comparable, let's say, to OAuth uh, for these small devices. And uh, that's something the, the ITF also has picked up. So there, there's a new working group, ACE, in the ITF that actually looks into this. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah, speaking of uh, OAuth for uh, for IoT, um, at, at EclipseCon uh, two three weeks ago, three weeks ago, we had um, an interesting talk uh, from um, uh, Paul Fremantle. Uh, I think the slides are on SlideShare. Um, yeah, it was pretty interesting. Uh, a lightweight model, uh, OAuth uh, kind of model for for IoT. It was uh, pretty interesting. So we've had a, a few more questions coming in. Um, yeah, do you guys have any thoughts on, um, uh, I mean, what it would take, uh, back to the first question about best practices around uh, um, MQTT and co-op communication workflows, um, do you, wh where do you think would be the best place to have kind of discussions around uh, yeah, such design patterns, uh, something similar to maybe the, uh, the GOF, you know, the Gangs of Four and uh, some uh, um, yeah, best practices as to uh, IoT communication. Is IETF uh, a, a, a working on it, maybe? Is that what you're saying, Matthias? There are lots of lots of working groups around the IoT. Yes, yeah, so actually there's a small draft um, for, for implementing co-op, um, including applications that, that I'm working on, but that kind of only covers the basics, so the do's and don'ts, and, and that's the way it was supposed to, to be done. Um, I was talking with some other people on whether there should be actually a document how to do RESTful IoT in a proper way because um, we often see yeah, ways that are not meant to be or we didn't think of it this way. Um, so we thought of it, but it's kind of hard to get this into the IETF. So we, we have to figure out what's the best place. And I think the best thing is if there's a stable um, community about, uh, around it that yeah, we, we have blogs and, and these kind of things and share, share the ideas. Um, have open source that that shows how how to do this. Yep, that that's true. Uh, wikis and and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, uh, yeah. I totally I totally agree on that. Um, a question, I guess that will um, uh, that will be for. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, I think something we didn't really mention, unless I missed it. Um, how can a standard web application use the data coming in over MQTT or co-op? Uh, so I, I guess, uh, yeah, Dominic, maybe you want to talk about uh, what uh, what one can do to uh, to use, for example, web sockets for, uh, with MQTT. Yeah, correctly. Um, I I don't know how to use with co-op, um, but with MQTT, it's it's pretty simple. Um, if you have an MQTT broker which supports web sockets, um, web sockets are a full feature transport for MQTT. <clears throat> that means your web application can use, send and receive MQTT messages. Um, of course, you need an MQTT library for that, um, but Eclipse uh, Paho has fortunately um, 
yeah, this kind of library, and you just you can just embed it in your web application and subscribe to messages and so on. And with this, you get really pushed to your browser. So it's it's pretty simple. And is the uh, I actually don't I'm not sure of the answer myself, so this is why I am asking. Um, is the um, MQTT over WebSocket uh, a standard already? Is it part of um, the Oasis yeah, yeah. specification process? Yeah, in, in the I I think there are non-normative comments in the current version of the specification about WebSockets. Um, yeah. The, the good thing is uh, MQT itself isn't affected by, by the transport. So uh, because it assumes TCP, but on top of WebSockets, you have TCP. It's just another layer. Um, but uh, yeah, you you can um, as it's it's not specified directly. But but if you have WebSockets, you have framing, and now it's. it's before the specification process started, um, it was that the MQT library uh, Paho implemented like this. You have one message is in one WebSocket frame, but now it's uh, one MQT message can be in several WebSocket frames. So yeah, it just doesn't matter. Um, okay, okay. And, and Matthias, about the uh, co-op bridging to the HTTP REST world, I guess it's pretty straightforward. How one would uh, do that, consume and, and talk to co-op sensors from a web app? Yes, yeah, so um, maybe that, that comes back to the question when to use what. So the nice thing about co-op is that you can really decouple um, server and client. So, so you have this loose coupling of, of services and so on. Um, so they can evolve uh, in different stages and so on, and um, you don't have to control both sides, which is, uh, as I understand it, uh, usually the case for, for MQTT. So um, currently the, the, the best way is to have a, a cross proxy, so something that uses this transparent mapping between co-op and HTTP to, to do it without changing anything in, in the browser application, for instance. Um, in the long run, I think, um, uh, I actually try to, to, to push co-op directly into the web browser that we have something in there. So for instance, there's WebRTC going on, so we already have UDP support in the browser, DTLS support, so it would make sense to push um, yeah, towards co-op in the browser as well. But as I said, currently you can use these, these cross proxies in a transparent way and include the sensors this way. Yeah, okay. Uh, so maybe um, one quick question. Speaking of proxying and stuff like that, how well those co-op and uh, do co-op and MQTT pass through firewalls? Any uh, feedback on that? So maybe if I just continue, so um, one mechanism that is in there is the this resource directory. So you have a, a co-op device; it's usually hosting a server, but when it boots up it uh, registers with uh, some of these resource directories. And this is actually kind of done also for hole punching into firewalls so that you can um, then also receive uh, UDP packets through, through that port that you used. Um, the other thing is if you just block completely this port or whatever and only open um, the, the holy port 80, then, then of course, um, yeah, you cannot do anything. But uh, there are mechanisms like this hole punching, or you can use proxies for instance, that um, yeah, then are allowed to, to access the rest of the internet and then do the internal communication, which is also helpful to shield um, small constrained servers from too many requests from, from the internet. OK. Yeah. Um, Dominic, very quickly, uh, any thoughts on that? And I think yeah, we need it's to... almost exactly the same with MQTT. Um, MQT has a, another port, so you can't use port 80 for that. Um, so your firewall should allow, for instance, port uh, 1883 for um, MQTT. OK, yeah, that's pretty pretty straightforward then. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, there is just one last question that we uh, will probably not discuss uh, um, here, but I encourage Alec uh, was a question on XMPP and XMPP IoT extensions to check out the, um, the demo session that we are going to have. Uh, let me check the time. Um, at the end of the, of the regular session, there will be um, uh, yeah, the second demo session is at uh, 4, um, 4 p.m. European time, um, Eastern time, sorry. 
Um, so yeah, there will be, um, I think, a demo about uh, XMPP for IoT, so you should definitely check that out. And thanks a lot to Dominic, Matthias, um, Tim, and Aidan. It was really very informative. Um, we got several questions about whether the slides will be online. Uh, I encourage all our speakers to put the slides uh, uh, online, either on SlideShare or whatever platform. And uh, the video is recorded, so if you check out on YouTube in a, in a couple uh, in a couple hours when the conference is over, uh, you can definitely uh, check out the presentations again. So thanks again to our speakers, and we'll be back online in uh, about 15 minutes with uh, the, the fourth panel connecting to the enterprise. Thanks for attending. <laughs>